Government School of Public Service and welcome this evening for uh, a wonderful lecture and a very special guest. This is another in a series of our public programs, our distinguished lectures, and our community conversations that Patrick Kennedy and Nikolai the Pepper have put together. It's an extraordinary schedule. You can see uh, on your chairs the, uh, the, the upcoming speakers uh, for May. And um, let me just tell you, we spent most of the day today, or a great portion of the day today, working on uh, our fall series. Yeah, and and I'll, I'll, I'll brag a little bit. It's, it's, it's going to be pretty good. So uh, I, I hope you all uh, will enjoy it. To uh, introduce uh, our speaker today is my friend who is the president and the publisher of the Arkansas Business Publishing Group, uh, which includes 15 publications including the very popular Arkansas Business Weekly and uh, Soiree, the uh, uh, highly read magazine that, uh, that everybody waits to see uh, who's going to be on the cover. Even a guy who got on an elephant to do it one time. It was an extraordinary uh, Our speaker is a graduate of Arkansas State University, uh, and he writes often about trends in business and in politics. On the side, he tries to play a little golf and manage his family life. Would you welcome publisher Jeff Hanks? Thank you, Dean Rutherford. I'm still trying to get used to the whole Dean Rutherford thing, but uh, so is everybody else. Very fitting. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Tom Stewart. And uh, you know, when you think about intellectual capital. We were talking about business and things going on in Arkansas and Little Rock, and I can't help but think that kind of the epitome of, of the two individuals who really understood the whole concept of intellectual capital in Little Rock were Jack uh, and Whit Stevens. That they knew from the beginning that if you didn't have the right people and smart people uh, to, to execute your business, then you likely couldn't be successful. And I, as I know many of you in the room feel the same way and have the same kinds of businesses as I do, that it's all about the people and intellectual capital. And Tom really wrote some, some groundbreaking information about that that has uh, been widely read, and I look forward to hearing it from him tonight. Tom is the uh, editor and managing director of the Harvard Business Review. Prior to joining Harvard Business Review, he was editorial director of Business 2.0, and a member of the board of directors, board of editors of Fortune magazine. In a series of Fortune articles, he pioneered the field of intellectual capital, which led to his groundbreaking 1997 book called Intellectual Capital, The New Wealth of Organizations. In turn, Intellectual Capital was named one of the most important business books of the year by the Financial Times. His second book, The Wealth of Knowledge, Intellectual Capital in the 21st Century Organization, was published in early 2002, and it reveals how today's companies are applying the concept of intellectual capital into day-to-day -day operations to dramatically increase their success in the marketplace. Tom Stewart is a Harvard graduate. Look forward to hearing everything uh, he has to share with us. Please welcome Mr. Thomas Stewart. Get to that in a, in a second, but I want to get 
a little bit to, to, to the idea of stories about leaders. I first recognized this about President Clinton when I was at Fortune, it was the summer of 2001. Um, he had been six months out of office. Uh, and he came to a Fortune conference that we gave, and he was doing one of his town meeting things. And I don't know how many of you have seen him do a town meeting thing, but it's one of the most awesome things. So he stands up there, takes questions, and turns into these amazing uh, uh, exercises in empathy and, and empathy and intellect combined. And at some point, somebody asked him some question. I can't remember what it was. And he said, well, you know, I think that um, in, the, you know, in the last year or so, he said, you know, there have been about 10 or a dozen books published about our founding fathers. And everybody, everybody ought to read five or six of them. The ones I liked best are, and he began rattling them off the title and off, you know, five, and rattling off five or six books by title and off. And everybody said, this guy can be read, and he's read all the books, and he remembered the title, and remembered the authors. And then he started telling me a couple of stories about how, in a couple of cases, decisions were made by these people and how those decisions might be talismans for a leader as he was making the decision. He also said something very interesting. He said, you never go as a leader, you never go from A to Z in a straight line. So you're always being blocked by people, there are always problems, and you always sort of try to keep your final destination in mind. It's like sailing, you're always tacking. Because there's always some wind, you're always trying to find what you can, but it's really important to never go lose sight of, of what your destination is and what your life is. So leaders love such stories. Um, there are three little leader stories that, uh, historical leader stories that, that I really like. Um, one of them is the story about Elizabeth I um, as Spain's Armada near, near England in 1588. And you know, these days we think of Elizabeth I and we think of Gloriana and we think of the British Empire and we think of the extraordinary charisma of Kate Blanchett in that role or, or about we think of Elizabeth I. But we, think, but we think of this amazing, successful queen, but it's hard to remember that back in 1588, Elizabeth, Elizabeth reigned over a divided, poor, weak, and very much imperiled country. It was religiously divided. Uh, uh, there, you know, she, she was you know, unmarried, and there were big questions about whether she would, you know, whom she should marry and everybody thought she would marry, and that in effect of compromising her sovereignty. And when the Armada came, this was the mightiest military force in the world coming to England. You know, her monarchy, Protestant England, and, and, and all the history that came after was very much in peril. And she came and spoke to her troops at Tilbury Docks. That's a very famous speech. Um, and actually, in the Kate Blanchett Elizabeth movie, it was quoted, or if we're not quoted here, she said, I, I have come amongst you at this time, not for my recreation and disport, but being resolved in the midst and heat of the battle to live or die amongst you all, to lay down for my God and for my kingdom and for my people my honor and my blood, even in the dust. I know I have the body of a weak and feeble woman, but I have the heart and stomach of a king and of a king of England, too. It's an extraordinary speech. And that speech defined her, it defined her realm, and I put it to you that that speech defined England. You can actually hear the echoes of that speech in every English leader sense. You can hear it in Churchill, you can hear it in Nelson, you can hear it in the, in the rhetoric of every English leader, and that image of him battled with England. That image of the it shows up in Dunkirk, it shows up in We Will Fight on the Beaches, We Will Fight, you know, it shows up in all of this. At a, even at a time when England was the biggest imperial power the world had ever seen, that embattled plucky little quality that she defined as her own leadership defined that nation. It's an extraordinary moment. One of my other favorite leadership stories involved a far flung harsh head, but involved actually the, the end of that empire, the beginning of that empire, the end of that empire. On a day in 1893, when Mahatma Gandhi boarded a train in Peter Maritzburg, South Africa, and he was ejected from a first-class compartment because of his color, despite him having a ticket. And he was protested. He was thrown from the train. He was parked in a freezing waiting room. This, of course, is an old waiting room. While the railway authorities took charge of his suitcases and put them in another room. In his diary later, he wrote, or his memoirs, he wrote, the cold was extremely bitter. My overcoat was in my luggage, but I did not dare to ask for it, lest I should be humiliated. So I sat and shivered. It was 
So Gandhi sat there feeling weak and humiliated. And he was afraid, he, you know, I mean, think of this, you know, I, I, if I ask for my overcoat, they'll simply say, yeah, and that would humiliate me even more. And that was the moment that he said, define him and his leadership style. And you know, this is a man who broke an empire by being weak and by discovering the strength of being weak. Now, again, an extraordinary moment in leadership. My third story, the third, third story that I liked a lot is the story of Franklin Roosevelt. We all know that he had paralysis, but we sort of don't know that he had paralysis immediately or nine months after losing a humiliating defeat. He was vice presidential candidate uh, with, with James Cox, who was resoundingly defeated by that paramount of virtue and presidential ability, Warren, Warren Harding, and his vice president, Calvin Schuller. So, and nine months later, Roosevelt is struck down by paralysis. He nearly dies. He goes down to Warm Springs, Georgia, and he spends seven years in, fu in a futile attempt to get back the use of his legs. And they're trying everything, and nothing is fundamentally working. But seven years later, he says, yeah, I'm not going to sit here, you know, Peter Maritzburg Railway Station, and be humiliated. I actually, I'm going to live. I'm going, you know, this is not the end of my life. I'm going to come back. And in 1928, he comes back and returns to public life, sort of annealed in the fires of his personal hell, runs for governor, gives the great happy warrior speech that got for Al Smith, and then goes on to be, you know, arguably the, best, arguably the, greatest, the greatest president of the 20th century, and, 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 you know, in my personal life, um, after Lincoln, the greatest, the greatest president of American history. And when he assumed office in the midst of the Great Depression, what was it that he said that we all remember? He said, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. And he knew that. You know, he knew that in a seven-year process of, real, of thinking that he had other things to fear. So, so why do leaders love these stories? Why, do, you know, why was there somebody on the plane today reading a church, a biography of Churchill? You know, I'm a middle manager reading a biography. Why, why, why is this? I think part of it is we all want to think of ourselves in heroic terms. Yes, I do. I'm engaged in the global struggle. You know, the mission of the Harvard Business to Review is to improve the practice of management and its impact in a changing world. And that is an heroic mission, ladies and gentlemen. It is, actually. I mean, I really believe it's a very important thing. So I like to see myself as being an important role, and I'd like to see myself as, as, as facing tests like Elizabeth faced or like God. Like, uh, and also, of course, we call, you know, in our little way, we do face these tests. You know, we think, well, what would Gandhi have done? What would Elizabeth have done? Or what would Abraham Lincoln do? Or as the song in South Park goes, what would Brian have done? So, so that's one reason that, that, that leaders love, because we want to think of ourselves as leaders. But the second reason, I think, is that we call on them when we face tests. And I think the interesting, one of, we were talking earlier today about how you teach leadership. And one of the things, one of the ways I think you can teach leadership or think about leadership is, is, is think about leadership as, a, as an act of responses to certain tests. Because if a person becomes a leader, she or he is put to the test all the time. You're always being tested. The first day you become the boss and you walk in with the new boss, what does he want? You know, what does he want? You know, you're, you're, you know, they're looking at you all the time, trying to read your mind, trying to read your, read your signals. Everything is a test. Um, you know, the way, you, the way a leader handles a crisis is a test. It either increases his political capital or, 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 or it bankrupts. The test may come from outside, like an act of war or a competitor's move, or it may be organizational, like launching a new business, doing a turnaround, or it may come from within, like a disease, like, 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 like FDR's polio. Ultimately, the tests of a leader, of a leader are both personal and political and organizational because the leader leads an organization. So the way a Bill Clinton or a George Bush or a Ronald Reagan or a, or, 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 or a, uh, a Jimmy Carter or faces his tests affects not just him. I mean, defi it defines him or her, but it, but, it, but it also affects everybody else. So these tests are important. Um, as I said, they're always being tested. And, and, and if you think historically or think mythologically, you know, a knight in search of the Holy Grail has to pass certain tests, or if you want to win the hand of fair maiden, you have to slay certain dragons and pass certain tests. Hercules, of course, had his dozen labors that he had to test, or Indiana Jones 
had his uh, had his test ticket passed to him for the law star. So there are, you know, this, this is something that resonates very, very deeply with us. And I'd like to talk about three of them and then sort of talk about a meta test, a test, the Uber test, a test of the laws, both of them. Um, the first is what I call the initiation test. It's the test of, of becoming a boss for the first time. And the second is the crisis test, the test of, of, of fighting back at, or facing the risk of failure or coming back after failure. And the third is the rejuvenation test, which is the test of reinventing yourself after you've been a leader for a while, sort of the second term test of presidential test. But that first test, when you first become a leader, is an interesting test. Linda Hill, who teaches at Harvard Business School, has studied this and has wrote a wonderful book called Becoming a Boss. She wrote an art, a recent article for us, um, sort of reprising some of this stuff. And she's done a lot of work on the crucibles that form leaders, not in government or corporations, and <coughs> the development of leaders in politics, so they talk sort of at an NGO or something where leaders develop in sort of unconventional ways and what they have. One of the things she's learned is that the first time you become a boss, you screw it up. Almost always you make mistakes. I remember the first time I became a boss, people said, she can handle all the administrative responsibility. And I said, I was young, and I said, uh, um, Actually, I spent less time being the editor-in-chief than I used to spend trying to get to the editor-in-chief. I mean, that flippant, clever answer was true, but it was an indication of what a bad job I was being, or what a bad job I was doing as a boss. Because, well, the first thing you learn as a boss is you're not really in charge. You know, I was actually talking, last night I was, I was, I was sitting at, at a table and gave a dinner uh, in Boston for some prop for, for, for uh, uh, my reporter and, and Gary Hamill. Kinsey, one of the best article of the year. We had a fabulous start to the dinner sitting at the table with our keynote speaker, who's Jeffrey Immelt, the CEO of General Electric. And we were talking about a certain person who lives in 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. And Immelt was saying, you know, I voted for the man twice. He said, but I'll tell you something. If there's one thing I've learned about being a leader, it's that people don't follow you just because you tell them to. And it isn't so just because you say it's so. And, 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 you know, and, and this is a thing that new bosses forget. They actually forget that they're not really in charge, that their job is to bring people, follows, followers don't follow automatically, and that you have to enlist them, you have to negotiate with them, you have to, you know, that the act of politics is an act of finding common ground, finding common interests and bringing people along, along with you. Um, Michael Porter and a couple of other professors at, at HBS run a, a seminar for new CEOs every year. And they found that there are seven surprises, and these are not first-time leaders, these are first-time CEOs. They found that they face seven consistent surprises. First surprise is you can't run the company. You think that they, you know, they could become CEO. Hey, no, I'm in charge. They're not in charge. You can't run the company. Second surprise, which is interesting, giving orders is very costly. If I actually, if I'm your boss and I say, I want you to do this, and, you know, that, that's expensive, I mean, much better for me to, and saying no is very costly. costly. You actually want to be in a position of saying yes as a leader to other people's initiatives rather than giving orders, because when you give orders, you deplete that bank account. When you approve things, you, increase, you grow your bank account, you grow engagement, you involved. The third thing is it's very hard to know what's really going on, and I'll get back to that. The fourth thing is you're always sending a message. I think this is extremely difficult for people, especially first-time bosses. They don't realize that you know if you roll your eyes, you're sending a message. If you act impatient, you're sending a message. And you're often not aware of the message you're sending, or you're sending a different message. I'm mad at my boss. I take it out on you, and you think I'm mad at you. You know, I had a bad night last night. You know, the kids. And stuff. You know, you're always sending a message, and that count to ten thing becomes extremely important. That awareness. That um, and oh, another message that CEOs talk about, that CEOs need to learn, is that, is that pleasing the shareholders is not the goal. You know, that you're actually, this is an interesting issue that leaders have to recognize that they have multiple constituencies and that part of their job is to bring them together to their truth. Uh, and the final one is that you're still only human, and I'll get back to that in a minute, because of course leaders get more past. Um, and I, when I became the first became the editor of, of uh, Harvard Business Review, I discovered something that had been unknown to my colleagues at Fortune or Business 2.0, uh, which is that I was really good at art and really good at headlines. 
you know, at Fortune Business 2.0, if I suggested a headline, lots of other people would say, no, that's not going to give me a better one. At Harvard, at HBR, when I became the boss, I suggested, oh, gosh, you are so good at headlines. You know, it was amazing. I just changed over my team really good um, at, at, at headlines. And, and, and I, you know, I guess it's always in me. <laughs> the second test is the test of screwing up. It's the test of making a mistake. Because, of course, every leader makes mistakes. If you're not making mistakes, you're not pushing the envelope. If you're not pushing the envelope, what are you doing? You know, be, be, be. Um, there are, of course, lots of good examples of that. New Coke is a famous, you know, famous example. The Edsel is a famous example. You've got great commercial examples. The Bay of Pigs is one of the great calamitous presidential examples, and it's a very interesting one, um, because if you look at the Bay of Pigs and then look at the Cuban Missile Crisis, you see the growth of a leader. You see a person in his first crisis, facing his first big decision, screwing it up because he thought he was the boss, because he wasn't. Because Bobby Kennedy's job during the Bay of Pigs was to, tell, was, to, was to tell other people, stop trying to convince my brother otherwise. His mind is made up, he's got the best, the best people have all agreed, it's a, it's a classic example of group think the main things. Um, it's, I mean, it's sight is a technical example. But don't try to change his mind. When it came to um, uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis, Admiral Stevenson was deliberately brought in to be you know, a truth teller, to be somebody who would take a devil's advocate position, and, and, and Kennedy was deliberately kept his options open, kept his mind open as long as it was a very interesting example. Of, 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 how to, of, of how to change and grow as a leader. So one thing that you learn from a mistake is that you, you, it, one thing that happens when you make a mistake is you have to, you have to study it. You know, an awful lot of people when they make a mistake say, let's put that behind me where they're afraid to look at it. You know, we've all had that situation. I don't want to go there. I don't want to feel what that was like again. But there's powerful work. I think that's one of the first things, we, a first test to a leader having made a mistake is are you willing to go and look at it and actually tell yourself and other people tell you the truth about what went wrong? Are you simply going to say, that was tomorrow, oh, if tomorrow was another day? If tomorrow was another day is the response to that, you know what, Scarlett, we're going to make the same damn mistake over and over again with the next, with the next chance in the other the most chance that shows up. But, but the other thing is, and so how do you do this? Jeff Sonnenfeld, who's, who's a great guy, who's just a Yale himself, a catastrophic fire University where he was falsely accused of vandalizing the offices of the business school where he was the dean. Uh, 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 Jeff wrote a wonderful book called Fire the Act, which is sort of how to, talks about how to rebound from mistakes. And one of the things he talks about is, is, is get others, get others to help you open up. A lot of us at times when we have mistakes, we, you know, we retreat into our into our shells. It's a very natural instinct that sometimes you do need to heal and retreat, but you've got to open back up. And, and get other people on your side. And the second thing he says is, 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 is admit your mistakes. Show, you know, show remorse and admit your mistakes. I and mean, apologize in public if you screwed up. I, you know, when I make a mistake, it's a view. You know, it's a great line. Uh, and, and, and then uh, and decide whether you're going to whether, whether, whether you need to actually admit that it's wrong or stick to your guns. And sometimes you were right. You have to be, you know, authentically and, and accurately analyze what went on. Um, and then figure out your mission. Because a lead, you know, leaders need missions. Leaders need some kind of, to them, heroic mission. And you got to rediscover it. You know, it's very difficult um, to, when you're hurt, to, 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 to remember what it was that excited you. Uh, we were talking about this earlier, thinking about thinking about the great excitement of, of kids in the 60s. Um, and, you know, Kennedy became president, and, 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 and everything, the world was going to change, and the world was going to be a better place, and we were going to march to sell them, and this, that, and the other. And then came, you know, Woodstock and Altamont and Vietnam, and it just became horrible. And it would have been interesting to see what had happened if somebody had been sort of ripped that people asleep for 10 years, and had come back in 1973 and said, why are you guys all so alone? And, and you know, how do you rediscover your heroic, your excitement, your youth uh, after a after mistake, after a calamitous mistake? It's a really <coughs> great test of a leader. The third test is the test of reinvention after you've been a leader for a while. It's, it's, I've been thinking about this personally because 
I'll, I'm, I'm now I've been the editor of HPR for four and a half years. It'll be five years in, in November. And we, when you think about fifth, when you think about round numbers, you start thinking about things. You think about seven year inches. I, you know, I've often thought that, that that careers go in cycles, and, and that you enter a new job and you're very excited the first couple of days. You lost a game of paper clips, and then you figure out what's going. On. You get this learning curve. It's exciting. It's, you know, you're learning something every day. It's almost so painful. And you get to the top of that moment, you get bored. I know my job. You know, and you have to start a new, a new learning curve. Yeah? Or you know, or you can, or this is when people are vulnerable to headhunters, or people start making stupid mistakes, and bad things happen. So you have to sort of reinvent your career. You know, when you apply for a job, you you, you sort of study the situation, you think, you make a plan. You know, well, I have this job. Here's how I. Have here are the five most important things that we ought to be doing. This is what, you know, these are the strengths, these are the weaknesses, these are the opportunities, these are the threats. You go through this and think, you come in and say, this is my job. You know, this is my, these are the things I'm going to try to do. This is my 14 points, my 10 points, my 4 even my, my, my new deal, whatever it's going to be. And then a few years later, the world has changed. First of all, you were, if you had 10 things you wanted to do, two of them were wrong. Um, five of them were really good, you actually and three of them are no longer relevant because the world has changed. Uh, you know, and, and, and you know, you come in and you say, "I'm going to tear down the Berlin Wall," and you're Ronald Reagan. You know, and it's, suddenly it's gone. And now what? What do you? You know, what am I going to do now? You know? um, so, so this this act of sort of reapplying for your job is, I think, a very interesting intellectual challenge. How do you have? Scott Fitzgerald famously said, "There are no second acts in American life, but there are second acts in careers." Um, you think of Jack Welch, who was the CEO of General Electric for, for 20 years. Um, you know, how did he keep himself fresh for, I think, really for the first 18 of those years, and his last couple of years, I think he was impatient you know, and started to smell the stable and started to get really, started to bully instead of being tough as he came up and became a bully. But, but, but for 18 years, that's pretty amazing to stay as fresh and progressive and keep things going and not be able to come up with new ideas and new points. In the Episcopal Church, if you're a rector, a long-lived or a long-term rector, I think, I think it's five years, but maybe seven years, they actually have retreats, they have camps. You're supposed to go on a retreat for a special program for people who've been the rector of the parish for a certain period of time because they get stale. And you only talk to these two guys, and those all these new parishioners, and they're not your, you know, you, you need to do in-group, or you've got an old in-group, you know, so you, get, you, you have to open up your social, your, your social circle, Reinvent your job, rethink your job. Um, so, so, how do you do that? I think it's a very interesting test that, that not too, that, you know, that, that if, if leaders don't pass that test, they, they suffer that second term I guess, that president so often get. I mean, oftentimes the president has a second term problem because it's, it, he has a late duck problem. But often he has that problem in the second term. He doesn't know what to do because he hasn't refigured out his to do list. He's run on his record and he sort of kept his to do list prime. So, so you have this, this interesting question. I mean, you can do nothing. You can, you can refuse to change and see yourself in a place where maybe you're relevant. People will rock in the stream and the stream goes around. Or you can realize that the next act requires new skills and learn. It could be Bill Gates who said something, hey, you know, this internet thing, it's real. And came down from the mountain and said, the internet can change and change, develop new skills and then developed another set of new skills and decided enough with running the company I'm going to spend most of my time on. Well, you can understand your limitations. You can say, I'm going to handle, you know, I can't handle this part, so I need a strong operations person. I need a strong outside person. I need, you know, I can do something else and understand that the company's grown, the job has changed, I need a different deputy, or I, or I need a deputy where I didn't need one before. Or you can line up line a successor who's better qualified, hand over the keys to the Ford and walk out. Um, I think one of the most interesting examples of a person who you discover the second act, or to discover the second act is the person who's aimed at this building. You know, it's, it's fascinating to watch, to watch President Clinton in his current role. It's fascinating to speculate on what will happen to his current role in the presidential campaign that's coming up and whether he'll be able to maintain his role as a saint, you know. Uh, uh, and, 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 it really, and it really is remarkable, it really is remarkable to see what to, to, to see to see his popularity and, and to see how people gravitate to him. You know, now that he's no longer a partisan figure, can he, can he remain 
um, parts of the area. But these are the three, these are three tasks that I think leaders face. And, they, and, and, and coming with them is a fourth test that's the, the toughest test of all. And that's the test of telling yourself the truth. Because the biggest problem, or one of the biggest problems that, 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 leaders, that leaders have is that leaders get less and less honest feedback. It's very hard, you know, it's notoriously hard to tell truth to power. And if you've got power, you know, people, you know, people don't get it suddenly. I said to me, I'm great at writing headlines, I'm great at making art. Uh, it's difficult to float trial balloons, too. If I, say, if I say, what do you think about this? You know, oh yeah, great idea. You know, I'm, when I'm in meetings, I frequently have to say, I want to ask this question as your colleague and not as your boss. You know, I have an idea. What do you think about it? It's very hard to bat ideas around if you're, the, if, you're, if you're the boss. So you need a group of people who can bat ideas around with, or you need the ability to take off one half foot on the other and have people trust you, which they won't often or always do. Um, you have difficulties in ego management. Sometimes you actually think, hey, I am the boss. I'm good. I've been doing this for a long time. Shut up. I'm the mommy. You know, you have that I'm the mommy problem. That, that, and, and you can get, get you, know, people, you can stop listening even to yourself. Um, you know, so you need, you need a confidant, you need a consigliore, you need a spouse who will tell you the truth. But even then, it's difficult to tell truth to power. Ultimately, since you're power, you have to learn to tell the truth to yourself. You have to learn to stand in front of the mirror, you have to learn to ask yourself a few questions. You have to earn, you know, I mean, they can't just say this question, how am I doing? Is it quite happy? You know, a little bit too fat, but well, you know, it's sort of that look in the mirror. How do you what what you know what how do you tell yourself what is the what are the questions you ask the person in the mirror? One of them is a set of questions about vision and priorities. Do I have a vision? Do I have priorities? And by the way, are my priorities and my vision the same? You know, if I actually looked at my outlook and looked at my priorities, how do they how do they match up? Uh, so so vision, priorities, and, and management. Second question is, is a question of feedback. First of all, do I do it well? You know, am I good at giving feedback? Am I giving, am I speaking truth to the people I want to have speak truth to me? And second of all, are there people who will tell me the truth? I've actually done, written into the job descriptions of two people who are on my staff that they're part of their job description is to tell me the truth. And it's not to restrain me. And, and the interesting thing about that is that when we have a performance review and it's on the job description, so I have, we have to talk about it. I'm not, I hope it helps, you know, but it actually is a formal case when I said, you know, Sarah has there, have you pulled your punches in at any time? And we're in a situation where she really, you know, and she's also, I picked her because I figured she wouldn't. But, you know, and, but then it gives her, then my second question is, has there been a time when you've tried to tell me something and, and suddenly, I, and I have means in my head, you know? So we actually have a conversation about that. I don't know if it works, but I think it's a pretty good idea to try. Succession planning, that's another question to ask, to ask yourself in there. You know, if I got abducted by aliens tomorrow, what would happen? You know, or, or do I really think I'm going to be the president for life, you know, some sort of tremendous time of year, a uh, uh, president for life, and I'm going to live to be 145, you know. Um, um, another one is evaluation and alignment. I mean, it's the sort of clean sheet of paper question. If I were applying for the job today, would I be doing today? If I were running this organization today, would I set it up today? At least, do I have the right people around me? Is this, if I were actually trying to set up my competitor today, how would I set it up? You know, would I set it up like this? Um, and then uh, the two other questions what happens when I'm under pressure? How do I behave? I know how I behave under pressure, it's really unattractive. Um, and, 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 and I'm not very good at it. It's you know, on my personal to do list is to try to figure out how, if I'm feeling under pressure, if you rush to feel you know, under, under time pressure in particular, how to shut up, cool off, and not be impatient with people who come in. It's, 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 it's probably my single biggest, uh, I don't know if it's my single biggest problem, it's the one that bothers me the most right now uh, as a leader. But how do I act under pressure and sort of get some honest sense of that? And another most subjective question is, am I the same person I am at work? Am I the same person at work that I am in the rest of my life? Can I, do, am I being too politically correct? Do I feel I have to repress my impulses, my desires, my, you know, at, at, at work? Or, you know, is there a match between who I am and what I'm trying to do?
do with the place where I am or where I'm trying to leave the organization. If you feel too much under, like, I gotta, you know, I've got to have my indoor voices, you know, like my mother's saying, you know, indoor voices, you know, inside voices, kids. If I have to wear my, if I have to use my inside voice all the time, that means something's, something's wrong. It's kind of an interesting, interesting thing. Ultimately, the ultimate test of a, of a leader is whether she or he can tell the truth to himself, to him or herself, to her or himself. Uh, the, uh, that, I think, is the way that you can resolve all those other tests. Those tests are going to come. There are going to be those tests of being the first time boss or being the boss of any organization for the first time. There are going to be those tests of screwing up. There are going to be those tests of, 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 of reinventing yourself, of, of, of being a leader for the long term, of being a tortoise and not just a parent. But the ultimate test is the test of whether you can look yourself in the mirror and say, you know what, it's not. I'm doing my best and it's a pretty good job, and I'm being pretty honest with myself about the kind of leader I'm doing. I think if we can resolve, if we can answer those questions and face those tests, all of us will be doing ourselves a bit of faith, a service, and most of all doing a service for the people who work for us and the people for whom we work. So thank you very much, and I'll invite your questions. Who'd never been able to make a landing. He made a trainer plane, number two 
it was sort of like a, like a driver's ed car with dual controls, right? You patch the back, the other guy's in the front, they both got a stick. And this guy is going to wash out. So it's three times, you have to land three times. The first two times, he washed out and the instructor had to land. Third time, Pat's the instructor, they're coming in, Pat's in the back seat, in the back seat and he takes his stick, breaks it off, taps the guy on the shoulder, says, throws it over. And I went. Pat became a pretty good boss. Because he knew exactly when to say, go and do it yourself. It was a great, it was a great moment. Any other questions? Yes, right. Do you think that all these tests necessarily have to be in leadership? You know, you got to start somewhere, and, 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 you know, I just told you a story about something that happened in the Army. I'll, I'll tell you a story about something that happened to me when I was a Boy Scout, um, uh, which is a, which, which I was 14, 13 or 14, maybe 14. The Boy Scouts have a, have a thing called the Order of the Arrow, which is an honorary camping society. It has a secret motto, whose initials are WWW, and, stand, and, and, and it doesn't stand for World Wide Web, but I'm not allowed to tell you what that stands for. Program uh, that the 
Fletcher School of Diplomacy at Tufts, Harvard Business School, and Harvard Law School run together called the Project on Negotiation. Um, that does, that has, has looked at this over the years, and they give a great negotiator award. Dick Holbrook won, won one of them. Uh, uh, the name of the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, whose name I forgot, was a Japanese woman. She won one, and um, they're just giving the award to uh, Bruce Wasserstein this year for who's, who's the, the, the investment banker. And they're thinking next year of giving the award to the, the, the leading candidate is Krista, the, the artist who does a, this big project that involved getting the mayor of New York to let him take over Central Park for a month, which is quite a negotiation feat. So I think negotiations have, and, and, and all of these political things are, are, are a very important part of leadership. And too much of leadership studied right now, I think, focuses on, on, on the psychology of the leader and, and, and a little bit more on the sociology and, and the political science of leadership, I think, would help us get a little bit better understanding how all these things fit together. So, how leader performs in these tests um, by its respect within the organization? What are the other sources from which a leader gets respect? You know, there's, there's a literature on power and influence, and and, uh, and, and so, uh, and I'm going to probably need more great hunks of that literature on, on power and influence. So, so if I ignore it, it's because I forgot it, you know, then I'll notice other But But if you think about it, I, I think a certain amount of respect, you, know, you start with some. You know, there might, you must know something because the walls, you know. Uh, and, and, and certainly, there's a certain amount of respect that simply comes from, from fear. You know, if, if a leader may have the power to fire you, or the power to, to, to ruin your career or give you a bad reference, uh, or the power to lead you into war against your will. And either a leader, you know, leaders have certain, so, so, so there's a certain fear factor, right? And, and I believe Machiavelli has said, a leader's better to be feared than to be loved. But, but that's actually not all that Machiavelli said. I mean, Machiavelli said if it's a choice between fear and love, choose fear. He said, but, 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 but that's, you don't want to be in that choice. You want to, you, you want to actually develop, develop respect. So I think you get respect from a certain amount of position. You get a certain amount of respect by knowing the subject matter. Uh, I think you get a lot of respect by knowing the limits of your knowledge of the subject matter. Um, and and by, by not pretending to an expertise you don't have. Um, and, and, and I think you get an extraordinary amount of respect by the people who are around you. Uh, I think the quality of a leader's team probably gets more credit for them than almost anything else around the leader. When people say, you know, well, the people who want to work for you uh, because it's a great team and want to work for you because the people who work for you, because you support them, so, and so you, the quality of the team around, uh, around the leader is there. And, and then I, I, I think um, you get respect for um, giving credit to other people and taking blame for yourself. Um, uh, and, 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 I, and I think that the, uh, you know, and giving credit for other people honestly. You know, I mean, there's sometimes, hey, it was my idea. You know, if I say, oh, I couldn't have done it without you, and you had nothing to do with it, I mean, that's sort of false flattery. You know, flattery, I don't think, it gets you very much. So I, 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 would, I would say that those, that those, that those are those four things. Yeah, one more question. Sector, the government sector, the food sector, the, 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 
Georgia. Um, he published a very interesting article by C.K. Prabhupada, whose working title, we changed it, this was a little too cute, uh, was MNC, that's Multinational Corporation, MNC.org meets NGO.com. And, and it was the basic, it was basically, you know, basically the idea was that corporations were starting to take on more social responsibility concerns, a lot of NGOs were trying to were trying to take on issues of, of, of economic development, saying, hey, we ought to really get involved in something, you know, Grameen Bank. What is Grameen Bank? Is it .org or .com? You know, it's a really interesting thing. And what is the local government in all this? It all gets into that. So we have that, and we also have not only manufacturing but now in services, more and more outsourcing so that you which is a good thing in the long run, at least is a lot of value in productivity. But it means that 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 you know, although a lot of oxygen, a lot of there's a pain in the process, but but, it's, but but it is a good thing in the long run. Um, but which means that you are more and more dependent on people whom you don't own to do things that you need. You know, 95% of all Cisco products are never touched by a Cisco employee. So there's a negotiation point, right? So the economic institution of Cisco is not defined only by its stock prices, it's defined by its relationships with others. So this is a very different leadership environment. You can't control the NGOs, you've got to live with them. You, know, you, you can't, you know, you, you know, an 800 pound gorilla can sit anywhere it wants, but if it wants to sit on little little chairs, it has to sit carefully, you know? So, 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 so it's a much more complicated relationship. Um, and I would just incorporate by reference a really interesting monograph that Jim Collins wrote called Good to Great for the Social Sector or in the Social Sectors. Um, and it was sort of an addendum to this book that he self published and get it on Amazon. He basically talked about a distinction between what he called executive leaders and executive leadership and legislative leadership. And legislative, a good example, his, one of his particular examples was LBJ, who's a great legislative leader. Let's get together, let's make a coalition, let's do the compromises, let's make the deal. And a lousy executive leader. He became a presidential, went against the president, he tried the legislative style to work for him, and what had become great work in the cloakroom became heavy handed stuff in, in, in the Oval Office. Um, and, and he suggested that these, that these legislative leadership skills need more definition and are becoming increasingly important. And that is the ability of finding the common ground, finding the compromise, finding the art of, it's, it's the art of the possible, keeping tacking while you look for, the, for, 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 look for your destination. I think actually President Clinton showed those in his last two years, or, or his last two years, but, but, you know, with, or actually after the contract, the contract for America, when he was facing the norm, when he was acting, facing the hostile Congress, and then when he was under all these other stuff, trying to work out what he could accomplish with what he got. Was like, very interesting example of trying to be that kind of legislative leader. I've got a feeling that it must be a much harder job in the show. You know, because it's a lot harder to see yourself in that heroic, you know, uh, uh, Indiana Jones mold. Uh, when it just, gosh, it's so, it, it's so Sisyphean or Sisyphean, pushing the rock up a little bit, and you come home at night and say, Did you have a good work, good day at work today? Yeah, I think I made a little progress. I think it must, must be much more emotional and difficult kind of, kind, kind of leadership. Um, and, and so the answer to your question is, I think it's a really good question. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, let's thank Tom Stewart for
that just because you're you're not advantaged and you can't travel and you can't see the world and you can't do things like a lot of other people, through books and through stories and through experiences you can learn. Uh, and you're all familiar with the great character Flat Stanley that everybody can see as it takes around and takes a picture of. First lady is given 22 Flat Stanleys to our students. And Flat Stanley is going with them uh, as they go uh, around the world. Uh, and then uh, Flat Stanley's keeping journals and coming back to share with First Lady who then takes it into the Arkansas schools to read the children about how you can grow up and so we have a great contest going on and has the most famous Flat Stanley photos. It's a, it's a, it's a great project. And sadly for you young people that are trying to move into the 21st century technologically wise and communications wise, uh, I'm 